Tell them you're doing good to be sitting next to me today. Because you are sitting next to God's anointed. You are sitting next to somebody with a testimony. You're sitting next to a prayer partner and a prayer warrior. You're sitting next to somebody that's been through the storm and the rain, but they made it. And I'm here to tell you that it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, the same thing he'll do for you. Do I have any witnesses in here that know anything about the grace and the mercy and the power of our God that we serve? You ought to stand on your feet and take about five seconds and give God the best and biggest and highest shout of praise and accolade that you can give him. Come on, let everybody in the embassy know you're here. Come on, raise it up one time. Yeah. Woo! Come on. Come on, one last round. Let everything that has breath give God the praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Anybody glad to be in the service one more time today? David said, I was glad when they said unto me, come let us go into the house of the Lord. Be seated if you can. Take your seats if you can. It's just good to be alive. It's a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord, to give God that which he so, so deserves from us. One element of honor that I would that we give to God is uh, that we introduce communion early. Uh, in our worship experiences. Uh, oftentimes it's the last thing that we do, uh, but I encourage us to do it early. I believe that if you start out with God, you can end up with God. Amen. It's just like praying early in the morning. For people who wait until the middle of the day to start praying, half the day is already gone. But there's something about getting up early in the morning. Our God was an early riser. The earliest thing that Jesus ever did was pray, and so oftentimes when his disciples would meet him in the morning, he was just concluding his prayer because he'd be up early in the morning. He arose early on the third day morning. And so if we start out with God, I believe that we can end up with God. So if you don't mind, I just want to invite God to be literally on the inside of us, and that's what we do every time we partake of the Holy Communion. It is Christ in us the hope of glory. We are inhaling and digesting the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. John chapter number six, Jesus declares that except ye eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you have no part of me. And I don't care how new or exciting or how fly your new church is, there's one thing that we should never cease from and that is our moments of sweet communion with our King and our Lord. And so for those of you who will participate with us as we prepare now to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper or the Holy Communion or the Passover meal, I encourage you to get ready now. If you have not received Holy Communion, real quick, just throw your hands uh, in the air and someone will come and, and serve you uh, as we prepare to take of the Lord's body and to take of the Lord's blood. 
discerning his body. He came from heaven to earth to show us the way. From the earth to the cross, our debts he paid. From the cross to the grave. And then from the grave back to the sky. So Jesus declares to his disciples, no man can take my life. I have the power to lay it down. And I have the power to retrieve it and take it back up again. Don't worry about all the intricate details. Don't worry about all the passages, but focus on the principle. The principle of the matter is this, that as often as you do it, whether first, second, third, fourth, or fifth Sunday, it can be a Tuesday or a Wednesday, it doesn't matter the day, but as often as you do it, here's what you do need to do, even if on the first Sunday, do it in remembrance of me. So as we place our mind on Jesus, we take the bread, which represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we take now and eat all of it. wine represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for the remission of sins. He says, take ye and drink all of it. And as he is, so are we in this world. And all God's children said, amen. Please do not leave your wrappers on the floor. Someone will come and Retrieve them from you. Even now, your tender mercies I see day after day. Great is your mercy towards me, your loving kindness towards me your tender mercies I see day after day forever faithful towards me you're always providing for me <laughs> great is your mercy St. Luke chapter number 12 the gospel as recorded by St. Luke chapter number 12 We'll look to verses 13, 14, and 15 from St. Luke chapter 12. If you would stand with me to reverence these three verses. St. Luke chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15. Here is what your Bible records from the King James Version, but any translation will suffice and one of the company said unto him master speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me and he said unto him man who made me a judge or a divider over you and he said unto them take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. I want to read verse 15, recapitulate in your hearing. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. That's the word that I want to share with you today. I want to talk about covetousness. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It is our theme this year, 
defined to be refined. We are currently in a series entitled Word Up for those of you who are new to us, where every week the Lord is giving us one specific word to define in order that we might be refined, to bring clarity and understanding to perhaps some things that we've been going through in our life. I believe that things do indeed and in fact happen for a reason. And even if those reasons cause us to look inwardly and see that many of the things that we are going through have a lot to do with who we are, I yet believe that Romans 8 and 28 is still in the Bible and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. One word can indeed and in fact move you forward. And maybe, just maybe, covetousness might be your word. I know I say it a lot, and I really mean it this time, as I've meant it in times before, but I really mean it this time, that the passage of Scripture, the verses of Scripture that I have just read in your hearing are probably the most profound verses that are found in the entire Bible. I mean that, I mean that. As a matter of fact, I mean it so much so that in your personal prayer time, your personal time of devotion, your intimate time with God, I would encourage all of you to read Luke chapter 12, not just selective verses, but to read all of Luke chapter 12. Read it in its entirety because I believe that there are some concepts that are critical for us to grasp help us to discover whether or not how we oftentimes feel about things and about life is even legitimate. There are some things that are chronicled and cataloged in Luke chapter 12 that give us so much insight and so much clarity to, to our Lord and our Savior. Things about him, his life and his characteristics, his mannerisms, his attitude, the way that he did things that might really and truly open up your mind and your eyes to a whole lot of other new things about God that perhaps we did not know. For instance, just to run a quick reference in just the reading that we dealt with, not even dealing with the totality of Luke chapter 12, there are a couple of things just right off the bat. You ain't even got to be a preacher to see it. A couple of things about Jesus. You don't even have to be a theologian to get it. A couple of things about Jesus. You don't have to understand Christology or pneumatology to get it. You've never been to Bible college before, but you don't have to go in order to get it. There are two things already that just leap off the page to you. If you're an atheist and you're reading, you'll know this about Jesus. Two things about Jesus. Number one element of Jesus that I found out just in the verses that we're reading is that there are some things, and a lot of people didn't know this, but there are some things that God himself ain't in. God is not in everything. He is absolutely, positively not in everything. Although he is everywhere, he is nowhere until you meet him somewhere. So there are some elements that God is, is not even in. If you just looked at the verses that we read, starting around verse 13, it's, it's right there in your Bible if you didn't tear it out. It says, one came unto him and says, uh, teacher, master, Lord, uh, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me, and, and Jesus says something that was cold-blooded. Back me up in the corner, Minister Latham. He said, who made me a judge? Uh, Jesus, the Son of God, he who knows no sin but became sin for us, he says, who made me a judge over you? That's critical because there's a whole lot of people at your cousin in the church who think that they are the judge. And if Jesus says, I ain't the judge, then you know, lean on somebody telling them, you know you ain't the judge. You you know you don't qualify if, if Jesus says I'm not a judge or a divider then you know you don't qualify to be the judge as a matter of fact not only are you not the judge you ain't even been selected to the jury can I get a wet wet from somebody that knows what I'm talking about you have not even been selected to the board of jurors there's some things that that he's just he's not in he's not wasting his time with that that's what Jesus is saying he says I'm not even going to waste my time with your petty situation I'm not going to do that and you have to be extremely careful and this is very important because the lesson that it teaches me is that in as much as God is not in everything that that leads me to say this and this is going to bring definition to somebody you've been dealing with some for the past six to eight months of your life Here's what I want to say to you regarding this. Um, stop putting pressure on other people to make your tough decisions. 
You're going to think about that when you get home. Stop putting the pressure on other people to make all of your tough decisions, the stuff that you don't know what to do about, and so you want somebody else to come in and to be the mediator, and not only the mediator, but the conclusion of the matter for you. Just so, just in case, what they say don't work, you got somebody to blame. The devil is a lie. Stop putting the pressure on everybody else to make your tough decisions. Here's what God is trying to teach us, that there is something that you're just going to have to do on your own. You're going to have to make up your own mind. You're going to have to stick to your own decision. Your, your ability to have some decisiveness about you is going to be key in this next season of your life because there are some things God says, I'm not even going to bother myself with that. Now, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, especially due to the fact that in this same 12th chapter of Luke, there is one verse that's going to tell me that even the hairs on our head have been numbered. They have been numbered. They've not been counted. He says they have been numbered. To be counted suggests that it's a part of a big group, to, but to be numbered suggests that it's very specific. It's down to the point. It's down to the key. It's very accurate. That means that if you stand over a sink and you comb your hair and a string of hair falls into the sink, he knows that that was strand number 233 because the hairs of your head have been numbered. It's very specific. Psalm 138 says even the things that concern you concern him. So if it's a concern of yours, then it is a concern of him. So how then could Jesus say I'm not going to be involved in that? Leave me out of that. Can I be transparent for just a moment? I can't tell you how many people have just turned their nose up me, at me and have given me, literally have giving me the hand because I decided not to get involved in they stuff. I thought you was a pastor. I thought you was a preacher. Ain't you a man of God? It looked like to me, looked like to me, you ought to be able to come in and do this. But there are certain things that you and I need to look at it and back up and say the devil is a lie. I ain't got time for that. I don't, I don't do that because here's the thing. Jesus understood I can't get involved in this situation and here is why. It's because covetousness is the basis and the foundation. It's the substratum of this whole conversation that we are having. You see, if it was not backed up by greed, then I would probably get involved in it. But you want me to deal with something on the outside of the surface when you are ignoring the elephant in the room about what's internally going on on the inside of you. He says the only reason that you are asking me to get involved in this situation is because you've got greed on your mind. And I've made up my mind that I'm not going to get involved in your petty situations. As a matter of fact, I made up in my mind that if I'm going to get involved in something, let me get involved in some big stuff that you're doing. What if I told you that the reason ain't nobody helping you is because you dreaming too small? Talk to me whenever you can. What if I told you that the reason ain't nobody came to help you is because what you doing don't require help? It's too small. It don't even require help. You're looking for a staff, and you don't even need a staff. You can do everything that's needed to be done right now. Uh, I'm convinced. What, check this out. Uh, that, there was a time I was talking uh, to Brother Kendall, actually. I was talking to Brother Kendall about some things one time, and you know the kind of work that he does. is It's, it's that big-time stuff. I ain't going to tell you exactly what he does, but he ain't like Tommy. He do really have a job. He really does have a job. It's a big job, and I was talking to him about some things and talking to him about real estate and loans and all that kind of stuff and I was talking to him about certain prices and he said well if you wanted to do something like that I would just have to refer you to somebody else because we don't handle those type of loans. I said well why don't you handle those type of loans? That, why don't you do that type of business? He said well it's got to be a certain amount before we'll even get involved in it. Okay y'all missed the shouting ground. You don't even understand what I'm trying to tell you. He says if it was a big project then we could have a conversation but as long as it's a small project I'm going to have to relate you to somebody who has handle small loans and small businesses but when you get into the millions that's when you talk to us but as long as you down there on the ground with the snails then we ain't got nothing to say to you may I speak to you first the natural then the spiritual the reason some of y'all frustrated is because you are a million dollar Christian and you still trying to deal with people who are on a lower level you keep fighting people that ain't even in your weight class you don't even know yet that discretion is the better part of 
valor. You're still hanging out low. You're still hanging out with pigeons and chickens when you don't even understand you're supposed to be an eagle. Eagles do everything up in the air. When they get ready to build their nest, they do it way up in the air. As a matter of fact, eagles are so off the chain at going high, they even make love in the air. They don't even come down on the ground. You didn't even know that. They do everything on the up and up. There are times in your life where God needs you to understand there are certain things that I'm not going to get involved in because they are too petty and minute for me to do it. You've got to get to a certain level to where my expertise will even be required to move on your behalf. I see some of y'all didn't like that, but I got to go ahead and come hard in the paint when I tell you that if you want to stop being so frustrated, you got to know how to choose your battles. Who am I preaching to in this room? Everything ain't your responsibility to deal with. Everything is not yours to get involved with. Sometimes you got to learn how to tell people no. You deal with that. When you really got a real issue, then you can come and talk to me. But all the stuff that's for the birds, I ain't going to be able to do it. You can handle that on your own. As a matter of fact, can I just say this uh, just in passing? There are certain things that myself, and I'm just trying to be defined myself. I'm trying to redefine my own life as well. I'm trying to get better every single day of my life. I, I, I would like to think that I'm a better dude at 33 than I was at 32. When I get 35, I'm still going to be 33. But when I turn 35, I'm going to want to be a better person at 35 than I am at 33. I'm not going to want to be the same person at 40 that I am. I'm at 33. I want to have grown. I don't know how you feel about that, but I want to be better tomorrow than I am today. And so there are certain things that I'm ironing out and I'm learning some things as I go and as I grow. In order for me to grow, there are some things I got to learn about God and there are certain things that I, I just made up my mind I ain't doing no more. I ain't going down on that level anymore. I refuse to do that. Like, for instance, for me personally, no offense to anybody, uh, don't get mad at me for this. And just pray for me if I'm wrong, but I believe I'm right. But certain things I don't do no more. Like, for instance, I don't counsel boyfriends and girlfriends. I don't counsel people that's just dating. We need to sit down and talk to you. We need to have a meeting. Like, are you engaged at least? Well, no, we're not engaged. We're just going together. Well, I'm not fixing to sit down and talk to you for two and three hours only for you to break up next week, and then I'm mad because you wasted my time. And really, I'm not mad at you. I'm kicking myself because I invested my time in somebody who never committed their life. Y'all don't want to hear this in here, man. Y'all, y'all don't want no reality. I just, I don't, I don't do it. I don't, I don't get involved in boyfriend, girlfriend stuff. You gotta go to another level. You gotta be saying, okay, we didn't set the date, you know, next year in May, so we need to go through some. Yeah, I'll talk to you about two or three times before you, you know, go on and jump the broom. But if you ain't made no commitment to each other, why you want me to commit? Y'all cried in this Presbyterian church, but look at somebody and tell them, you got to raise the stakes a little bit. You, you got to go to the next level. You want everybody to help you with stuff that you can handle on your own. He says, I'm not a divider between you. I'm, I'm not a judge between, between you because really, check this out. Here's point number two. Second, the second thing I learned, I ain't even got the covetousness yet, but check this out. He says, not only is God not involved in everything, but check this out. This is going to mess you up. You ain't going to even want to hear the rest of this sermon after I say that, but I'm going to bring you back around. I promise you. I can't, I can't cut you without sewing you back up. Okay, this is surgery. Check this out. Not only did I learn that God ain't in everything, but second thing that I learned from just what we read, just what we read, I learned you ain't supposed to get some out of everything. You are not supposed to get some out of everything. Check it. Here's what Jesus said to this brother. He said, who made me a judge, I'm still in verse 13, or a divider amongst you? Look at verse 15 if you didn't tear it out of your Bible. He says in verse number 15, take heed. And beware of covetousness. Okay, 13, he says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. 14, Jesus says, man, bro, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Verse 15, he says, take heed and beware of covetousness. Why would Jesus even say that? It's in verse 14. Who made me a judge or a divider over you? 
Here's what God is saying. The only reason you even asking for an inheritance, it ain't because you need some, you just want some. Y'all ain't talking to me. You telling me to tell your brother to split the land with you and you already got some land. You don't even need that. Can I tell you, sometimes the best thing you need to get out of something is your dignity. Y'all ain't talking to me in here. The best thing you need to get out of something is to leave with your respect because that's all covetousness suggests on the other end is that you already got enough of what you need. You just see an opportunity to get some more of something that you already have and you want to get mad that nobody will satisfy your greed. But let me put it to you like this. You see, I feed hungry people. I don't feed greedy people. Preach, Pastor White. I'm coming hard in the pain. Y'all ain't ready for me today. I done put my suit on. I came in here ready for y'all today. I don't feed greedy people. I only feed hungry people. People, those who have a desire for what it is that they are starving for, something that I do not have that I do need. Even Jesus says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He never said anything about feeding greedy people. So Jesus says, beware and take heed of covetousness. Beware of covetousness, which, by the way, if you're taking note, the definition of covetousness is greed. Is greed. It is greed. That's all covetousness is, is, is greediness. I know you thought it was jealousy. You thought it was envy, but there's a small but important difference between jealousy, envy, and covetousness. Would you like to hear the difference between all three? Yeah. Yeah. Je jealousy comes into play. Look at everybody sitting on the edge of their seat. I need to get this. <laughs> Because some of y'all are dealing with a jealous man right now. He's a jealous man right now. He's so jealous. But let me tell you what jealousy comes from. Let me tell you what it stems from. El Cana is the name that is given to God, the Lord our God, who is a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Now check this. Jealousy comes in only as it pertains to when you have a possession of a thing or you own a thing. It is yours. Jealousy is only in perspective when it looks like your territory has been threatened because of something that you own. The reason that God is jealous is because he deserves to be jealous. He qualifies to be jealous because he owns everything. And so since he owns everything, when you begin to wink at other gods, he feels some kind of way. If I didn't own you, if I was not your creator, your sustainer, your keeper, your provider, your protection, if I was not your uh, propitiation, if I was not your peace, if I was not your joy, if I was not your love, if I wasn't keeping a roof over your head and food on your table and clothes on your back, then I wouldn't have a reason to get jealous when you start leaving me and acting funny and crazy but when I consider the fact that everything you have I gave it to you and then you have the nerve to turn your back on me God said yes I feel some kind of way because I made you in my image and after my likeness it's in you it's in me that you live move and have your being so yes I have the tendency to feel some kind of way when you start to turn your back on me because I claim ownership to your life I have the blueprint on your life I create your DNA. I created you so specifically, so fearfully and wonderfully made that nobody else has your fingerprint. As a matter of fact, I want you to just reach over and just hold the person's hand that's next to you and just squeeze it a little bit. Just reach over and hold their hand. Hold their hand, just squeeze it a little bit. Look at them and tell them you'll never touch another hand like this another day in your life. No. Just squeeze the hand a little bit longer. Squeeze a little bit longer. Tell them enjoy that while you can, baby, because you ain't never going to touch another hand like this one another day in your life. You see, that's all God's doing. Nobody else like you anywhere on the face of the... That's why people have a hard time figuring you out because nobody like you has ever come here before to be an example on how to deal. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. No wonder God gets jealous when we start acting crazy with him. No wonder he starts feeling some kind of way when we turn our backs on him. That's jealousy because he owns. But envy differs. 
because envy suggests that you feel some kind of way over what somebody else has, watch this, but you don't feel like they deserve. That's when it's envy. Are you getting that? You, you being spiritual with me right now. It's envy when somebody else has it, but you don't feel like they deserve what they have. It don't necessarily mean that you want it. you just saying they don't deserve it. That's why the Bible says, uh, Psalm 37, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious. Against who? The workers of iniquity. The workers of iniquity are the people who are not righteous like you, but it looks like they're living better than you. That's when envy sets in because they ain't going to church like you're going to church. They're not sowing seeds like you're sowing seeds. They don't put in the time with God like you put in the time with God. And it look like all the stuff you praying for, they driving it. The stuff that you praying for, they living in the house that you praying for. and Driving a car that you wish you could have. They making the kind of money that you thought you should be making by now and it looked like every time you turn around you having a bad day you always sick but every time you go to work them jokers don't never even cough it don't look like they'll never be wrong with them that's when envy sets in because it's something that they have that you don't feel like they deserve that's when envy comes in that's why every now and then man I've talked to certain people who are pretty well to do people they're making some money and, but then they begin to tell me their jobs I was talking to a plumber that makes some good money money as a plumber and he talked about his job he said man I remember times where I've had to go through tunnels and had to go into very small places and I've had to deal with pipes and I'd be down there for 20 30 minutes at a time and come out then I go back an hour he said but when I think about it man they pay me all that hundreds of dollars an hour man it's it's all good I can do it and I look at him and say bro I don't envy you I don't, I don't, I don't envy you. That's what I'm saying. I don't envy you when I see how you living and what you drive, but then I know what you do in order to get, bro, I don't envy you. I ain't mad at you. I don't hate on folks that saints. I ain't even finna hate on the wicked man that'll do what I ain't willing to do. If you willing to go up on a skyscraper and watch some windows that high up in the air, bro, by all means, make your paper, bro. Jesus says, lo, I'm with you always, so I'm gonna stay out here and I'm going to preach and do my little job and whatever I get, God, I thank you for you. I don't have to have a match just give me a place to sleep because I ain't finna do what other folk do. And the problem at your cousin them church is that they keep envying people who got what they ain't got but you don't do what other folks do. Can I get a witness from somebody? Everybody that's hating on you because of how you living, half them, they don't even be up when you at work. They still rolling over in their bed. By the time they finally get to work, you're going on your first break for the day. And when they leave, you still at the job. And they got the nerve to hate on what you The devil is a lie. Lean on somebody and tell them, you don't know my story. Don't you dare try to judge my glory if you don't know what I've been through. How you going to talk about what he's led me to and you ain't been through what he took me through? Preach, white. I'm doing the best. So jealousy suggests that I own something and I feel some kind of way when my territory is being threatened. Envy says that somebody else has something, but I don't feel like they deserve it. But covetousness is deeper than that because covetousness suggests that somebody else has it, somebody else owns it, but it suggests that I don't feel like they deserve it, but I do. I do. It's mine. I do. Somebody else has it. Envy says somebody else has it. I don't think they deserve it. Covetousness suggests that somebody else has it. I really don't think they deserve it, but I feel like I do. That's when covet comes in. Watch this. Uh, covet sounds like cover. So basically, covetousness suggests this. Somebody else got it covered, but you want to cover it too. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, somebody else handling it. But your greedy self want to handle it too. Like you already got your job, but you like the job somebody else has, so you want to cover that shift too. It's like it's like you on the football team, uh, you a lineman, but you want to be the quarterback. And so the quarterback saying hike, and you want to stand next to him and say hike too. That, that, that's what covetousness is. Watch this. Because here's what it says. Covetousness says I'm not content. 
with what it is that God has already given me. Uh, covetous people never stay in their lane because they have yet to grow to understand, here's the whole thing about covetousness, and you need to write this down, get this in your sticky note, put it on the altar of your heart. Never forget this. Covetousness always bears in mind that grace has already been extended to you. All right, y'all don't know when to say amen. Let me help you. You greedy for something, when you don't even understand that you don't deserve the sum you already got. Thank you for them four claps. <laughs> Covetousness says that I'm so focused on what I want until I've overlooked the fact that I've been graced with what I already got. Okay. Not y'all, because y'all better than this, but that's your cousin them church, all right, at Pine Grove. I'm going to go over there and tell them this. Stop complaining that you didn't get a raise because the truth is they wanted to fire you. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. You mad they didn't give you a raise, but you come to work late every day. You playing games on your cell phone, and you filling out applications to work somebody else, and you mad that they didn't give you a raise. You better be glad they didn't give you a pink slip. Preach white I am. That's what's going on with this brother in the text. Jesus saying, you trying to make me be a divider between you and him, when the truth is, bro, you don't need that. You just want it because it's there. You eat just because it's there. You ain't hungry. You're eating just because it's there. Taking advantage of it just because it's there. Just because you can. You just got to get some. Since it's there, you know, you just, you just, you just see stuff. You just see money on the ground. Just got to get that quarter like you're going to be broke if you don't get it. See, somebody else gets up. Like, you got to, somebody else go shopping. You just got to go shopping yourself. You know, you know, just because just the shoes went on sale don't mean you got to buy it. Amen. Brother, say amen, because the women ain't finna say nothing right now. Just <laughs> nothing right now. Just nothing. Just nothing. How many know that a sale is still too high when you broke? Forty percent off, but if you ain't got the forty percent, it's still too high for you. Okay, let me move on. I want y'all to keep coming back to the Forward Christian Center. I don't want to lose no members. Get this. Here's here's what's his critical aspect of it. The enemy of covetousness is blind. This is the main point that I want you to get out of this message. I ain't got much left to say to you after this point. The enemy of covetousness is blindness. Because covetousness says you don't even recognize what you have because you greeted for something else that you want. And hear me when I say this. I'm going to bust somebody's bubble at your cousin church because you're going to tell them this. Sometimes what you greedy for ain't even as good as what you already got. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Who heard what I just said? Sometimes what you are greedy for ain't even as good as what you already have. I was watching, I was watching Steve Harvey's show. You know, the sitcom, Steve Harvey show. And um, it was one episode. Let me just show you how blindness and covetousness play hand in hand. Um, Lydia, Liza Guthman, Lydia was working in the office at the school. You know, she was going in there and doing some clerical work, or whatever. And uh, it was, um, was it Secretary Appreciation Day? 
Secretary of Fisher Day, Administrator's Day or something like that. And so um, uh, Principal Greer came in and gave LaVita, her assistant, a gift. You know, gave her a gift. And so uh, Lydia looked and said, um, <coughs> did, did you leave mine in the car? Did you leave my gift in the car? She said, uh, no. She's like, uh, today's Secretary of Day. Uh, you know, Miss Jenkins is my assistant, and so I, I brought her a gift. So she says, so what am I doing here? Am I not assisting you? And she says, well, uh, Miss Jenkins is on the payroll here. She gets paid for what she does. So that's why I brought her a gift. So Lydia says, well, in addition to not getting paid, you also didn't bring me a gift? And so Ms. Greer had to just come out and flat out tell her and just bust her bubble and say, well, the only reason we even created this position for you is so that you wouldn't have to eat lunch with all the freshmen during lunchtime. That's why we really good. So you tripping over not getting paid and not getting a gift when you don't even know the only reason you in here is to keep you from being humiliated. Oh, God. Oh, God, I just helped somebody. You don't even know when to receive it. Sometimes you can be so blinded by your own covetousness until you can't see when somebody already meeting you halfway. Preach white I am. So I've already met you halfway. You tripping over land that you ain't getting when you already got your own. You tripping over Money that you ain't making when you ought to be glad that they ain't let you go from the one you already got. You tripping over somebody else's family when you don't even know that behind closed doors, they family crazier than yours. You better be thanking God for your crazy nieces and nephews and brothers and sisters and uncles and, 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 and nieces and, and aunties and grandmama and great grandmama. And them. I know you're one drunk, but you got two drunk people in your family. They got eight drunk people in theirs. You know, you better be thanking God for what it is. Watch this. Not only that you have, but can you thank God for the stuff you ain't got? Some of y'all, okay, y'all looking at me all holy. Some of y'all need to be thanking God for the Negro you didn't marry. Can I get a witness from somebody? You need to be thanking God for the car that you didn't buy because had you bought that car and you messed around and got demoted and you wouldn't have been able to even take care of the needs of it. Can you thank God for the house you didn't purchase and for the people that you didn't give your number to? And can you thank God for the food that you didn't sleep with? I mean, my God, y'all so quiet in this prayer. Y'all get on my nerves being holy like that. But covetousness will happen of you wanting stuff and you don't even know you already got what you are asking for we didn't read this but I want you to read it in your spare time when you get home if you ain't never done anything a pastor has ever asked you to do make sure you read Luke chapter 12 because right after verse 15 he's going to start telling you the story about a rich fool who said I'm going to do this and I'm going to build bigger barns and his soul end up being required of God and what God was basically trying to say to him is uh, your greed has gotten you to a place that you don't understand when you need to start being satisfied. You don't even know that you've reached your level of satiety. You don't know that your level of satisfaction is already there because you always thinking about next. You always thinking about next. What's going to come next? What I get next? You think about food, why you eating it? You think about money, why you cashing your check? It's just always something else. But here's what Jesus said. A man's life, I'm going back to verse 15, and I'm done right here. You can get ready. Luke 12, 15, the last part of it, he says this, and tell your brother them this, tell your sister-in-law this, for a man's life, consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Your life is bigger than what you have. Don't you know if it was that deep, it couldn't be gone so easily? The most important things in life cannot be taken so easily. Anything that's not really that deep can be taken easily. One hurricane 
can destroy your house. One slip up on a job, you could be making $250,000 and be gone just like that. But love lasts forever. When you got peace and joy, let's go old school. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it. Y'all grew up in the old church like me. And the world can't take it away. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But Jesus gave it to me, and I'm going to let it shine. Can't nobody take the things that God has given to you on the inside. So he says, I need us. Watch this. Here it is, and I'm done. He says, I need us to be released from this spirit of covetousness. And here's the main reason why. Because there's more to life than the stuff that we're greedy for. Don't be so blinded by it, so focused on promotion, and you ain't thanking God for the fact that they letting you stay there. You so focused on getting a, a bigger house, bro, when you ought to be thanking God that your wife want to still be in a house with you. <laughs> You've been praying for a big house and can't get one, and you just ought to be glad she want to be in a little house with you. <laughs> Yo. Blinded by covetousness. Everything you complain about is something you've been given. You've been graced. You've been graced. If your car don't have any air, your neighbor just wish they had the car. <laughs> Health insurance high. Your neighbor just wish they felt good. You talking about car insurance? And you got wheels. They just wish they had that. House note. Who, Lord, is some serious? It's real. And your neighbor just wish they had a house. They credit score wasn't even good as yours. And you complaining about what you got. You can play softly, Gerald. I am praying for the body of Christ at large that as we are defining ourselves this year that we understand the main lesson that Jesus wants us to get out of this is that greed is so strong that you can keep inhaling and taking in and what's going to happen if you ain't careful you're going to bust I'm talking to somebody right now you working overtime just because they offered it, not because you need it. You working all them hours just because they, they give it and you don't even need it. And you wondering why you tired all the time. You chasing money that you ain't got time to spend. You got to order everything offline because you ain't got time to go to the store. If you could order your groceries, you would pray that they would just deliver your groceries because you ain't got time to go to the grocery store. Greed, covetousness, that's what it is. Extra stuff. And sometimes we'll even make the excuse that we're trying to do this for other people. And some of the stuff you're trying to do for other people, they don't even want that. They ain't ask you for that. They ain't ask you for that. They ain't ask you for that. Doing all this extra stuff so you can buy designer's clothes for somebody you love. And they're like, I'm, I'm cool with regular stuff. I just go in the closet and pick out something I ain't worn in a long time. I'm you trying to buy a Bentley for somebody that'll be cool with a Honda Accord. You, that's your greed. That's your greed. So I've concluded this, and maybe you'll take this with you, and you can tweet this. You can Facebook this right here, whatever you want to do. But I'll close by saying this. I don't want nothing God didn't give me. Who feel like I feel? I want everything he has for me. Don't get it twisted. But I don't want nothing God didn't give me. Put it just like that on Facebook, LaChester. Ebonics and everything. I don't want nothing God didn't give me. What are you trying to get that God didn't give to you? 
What are you greedy for and not hungry for? And that element right there might be the thing that people see in you that'll make them want to bless you on the next level because you're not being greedy. That's why I want to bless you. God comes to Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 3. I shared this in the first service this morning. And he says to him, he says, whatever you ask me for, I'm going to give it to you. How would you like for God to show up in a dream or a vision and say to you, whatever you ask me for, I'm going to give it to you. Boy, I got a list. I got a list. You don't want to hear my list. <laughs> but Solomon, of all the things he could have selected, he says, God, give me an understanding heart. That's all I want. I need to be able to discern the difference between right and wrong, a good decision and a bad decision, so that I can lead your people. God said, boy, you done tripped me out. Boy, you got me up in heaven shouting about your response. He says, I thought you was going to ask for me to kill your enemies and give you a whole lot of money. But because you weren't greedy, because you just asked me for something that could bless other people, I'm going to give you what you asked for because I'm a man of my word. But I'm also going to give you what you didn't ask for. I'm going to make you famous. I'm going to make your name great. And I'm going to give you wealth. Bill Gates ain't had nothing on Solomon, y'all. In this generation, he'd be worth about $500 billion. $500 billion by himself. I ain't talking about his business. I'm talking about him personally in this generation. Why? Because he didn't let greed become his prevailing prerequisite. I don't want nothing God didn't give me. And by the way, I'm giving a benediction right here. What God has for you, is so much better than anything you had planned for yourself. I'm done. Can you just give God a praise for that? <laughs> what God has for you is better than what you got planned for yourself. Let God give you your next job. Let God give you your next increase. Let God give you your next raise. Let God give you your husband. Let God give you your wife. And whatever God has for you is much better than anything you envision for yourself. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for the strength of your word, for the power, for the validity of your word. I pray, God, that this word has not fallen on deaf ears. Help us not to be blinded by what we want until we overlook, in God, what you've already given to us, seeing how great it is right where we are. God, as you give us godly opportunities, help us not to pass up on the things you have for us. But anything that you're not leading us into and anything that you've not placed on our heart to pursue, but we're just taking it just because we are takers and we're taking it just because it's an opportunity. But if it's not a godly opportunity, it's not even a good opportunity for us. I pray, God, that you would show us the difference between you moving and us moving and help us to operate within those parameters. I give you praise and glory for making known to us and revealing to us the mystery of your will. Now be pleased with us from this day and henceforth and forevermore in all of our dealings, in all of our affairs, in all of our business, in all of our ways. We want to acknowledge you and you shall direct our paths. We count it done in the name of Jesus, we pray. If you receive it, give God a big amen. Give God a big hand of praise. Hallelujah. Come on, let's raise that up. Everybody say thank you, Lord. You, you, Lord. Come on, let's prepare our hearts for giving right now. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let him hear you. Oh, Lord. Thank you. You, you, Lord, oh, I just want to come on, tell me, you've been so good, so, so good. Come on, raise your voice. You've been so good. Thank you, Lord. 
so good. You've been so good. So I know you've been good to me. I just want to tell you you Lord. Tell him one last time. Tell him thank you. Let him hear you. You Lord. Come on all over the building. Thank you Lord for every door you opened for me. For every bill you've ever paid, for every tear you've ever dried, oh, thank you, Lord. Yeah, Lord. That's good. I just Hallelujah. Hallelujah.